Hi, welcome back to Emmy Reacts, where I'm watching Game of Thrones for the first time. Today we are watching the season seven history and lores, histories and lore, whatever that is, the like kind of extra animated scenes video that they make for after each season. Winding down now, we only have one season left after this one, ended with a lot of crazy things happening and some revelations at the end of this last season. Most, well, a couple big things. One, that we have a dragon monster now. Sorry, it's been like a week or two since I finished season seven, so I'm reminding myself where we're at. So, yes, there's a dragon monster now, and they've, the army of the dead and the Night King and all them have made it past the wall because of that, so that's not good. And we found out, we knew that from the season before that John, that John isn't really Ned's bastard, but a Targaryen. We found out even more about that this time in this last season finale, that he's not even a bastard at all, that he's like the legitimate heir to the Iron Throne, which is crazy. But he was also doing it with Daenerys at the same time, who he's related to. So that's gonna, that'll, that'll be interesting in this next season. But I always like listening to the histories and lore to see, or to kind of help fill in some of the gaps and just extra insight into the different things that happened in this season. But I'll keep announcing this as I go along. But just so everyone knows, I am gonna be starting House of the Dragon once I'm done with the Game of Thrones reactions because I want to try to line it up for when the second season premieres this summer to try to, you know, be ready for when that drops. So I'll be kind of jumping right into House of House of the Dragon once I finish with Game of Thrones, which is wild to be finishing with Game of Thrones. It was it's a, it's been a long journey to get to this point. Like I said, I'll probably say more of that in the when I start my season eight reactions, which will be coming soon as well. So I don't think I have too much else to say other than let's just dive in and watch season seven, histories and lore. Starting with Jorah. Am I supposed to know what the Golden Company is? Are they going to explain to me what that is? I hope so, because I don't recall. When I fled Westeros, I washed up where most as Grace Knights do. The Golden Company. Oh, good. The best this of the Eastern Cell Sword companies for what, what I was worth. asking about last 20, season about what battle hardened men, horses, and Dora even did to be um, ready to kill their employers' enemies, no matter the cause, disowned. no matter the result. The Golden Company began as revenge. On his deathbed, a Targaryen king legitimized all his bastards, either to buy his way into the seven heavens or spite the family left behind. As everyone knew would happen, his great bastards weren't satisfied with their father's name and wanted his throne as well, under the yeah, banner of the new House of Blackfire. <laughs> their true-born brothers disagreed. When the Blackfires lost the Civil War, they fled to Essos to gather a new army and return for what was theirs. But wars cost money, and Aegor Rivers, the leader of the Blackfire forces who now called himself Bitter Steel, decided he could sell his army services to other lords while waiting to return to Westeros. The Golden Company was born. For their words, they chose beneath the gold, the bitter steel, to remind themselves that they weren't just hired killers, but They're knights bitter? of Westeros <laughs> who'd one day retake their home. Yeah, they were also bitter about they it. They never tried, because they were too successful as sellswords when Kohor declined to pay the new Golden Company for its services, Bitter Steel dared what even the Dothraki failed to do and sacked the city. After filling the company's coffers, he declared that unlike all other sellswords, the Golden Company would never break a contract. So they haven't. But they also don't take contracts unless the odds are heavily in their favor. Cowardly, perhaps, but far from foolish. Quite a few wars have ended with one side learning the Golden Company agreed to this fight on the other. Is a good fighter? Is this where he like, learned it all? Just their reputation is he a good fighter? Yeah, he's a good enemies. fighter, right? For some, it only takes one look at the captain's war tent surrounded by the gilded skulls of former captains. Ooh. Many splintered with the wounds that killed them. Any sellswords who'd waste that much gold must have a lot of it. And nobody pays in defeat. Could the Golden Company ever take Westeros? They get more practice fighting than the average much... knight, and their elephants could make Many a mess on the battlefield. Make up the Golden Company. But men who fight for gold will never fight as hard as men who fight for home. I should know. I've done one. Now I do the other. That's true. 
He has something worth fighting for now. <gasps> Sam! I love Sam. Him and Davos, I think, are my top The characters. Citadel of Old Town is the greatest center of learning in the world. Not that it has much competition, really. Most lords think of books the way they think of younger sons. Useful to have around, as long as they keep to the corners. Back when House Hightower still ruled Old Town as kings, a crippled younger son sought solace in books and those who wrote them, and became the greatest patron of learning in his day. Scholars of all sorts flock to Old Town to debate and write and... debate. <laughs> After this Prince Peramore's death, his brother granted land to Peramore's pets, as the wise men were called, though now they're known as maesters. Like the Night's Watch, the Citadel accepts any boy into its halls, be he a lordling, peasant or bastard. Merit, not birth, determines advancement. That's nice. Once a novice proves adept in a field, he forges a chain link that signifies his skill. Black iron is for ravenry, gold for sums and accounts, silver for healing, iron for warfare, valyrian steel for the higher mysteries. Do you have to have one mysteries. of each of them to be considered Magic. a maester then? No, nobody likes to say the word in the citadel. Or explain how dragons fly or dead men walk. Once an acolyte has forged enough links to make a chain, he becomes a maester. Okay. Should Just he continue wait, my studies, questions he might rise answered. to Archmaester and be given a ring, rod, and mask forged from the appropriate metal for his chosen field. Oh, so they can get, like, the specialized. The wisest, or most ambitious of the Archmaesters might even be called to serve as a Grand Maester on the small council, responsible for steering the king and the realm. Oh. As well as that's keeping like the Citadel informed of what, everything. like, Grand Maester Pycelle was? The heart that's of the Citadel get to that is point. the library which contains tomes from all over the world on every subject imaginable. From the trivial, to the essential, to the restricted. If the world ended tomorrow, Section, we could like rebuild it with the knowledge contained in these books. Theoretically, let's hope it doesn't come to that. You're good. That's what you're trying to prevent. Learns, the Citadel is more than a building, more than a library, more than the Order of Maesters. It is an idea that we may know the world. Not completely, not in any one man's lifetime, but piece by piece. With each generation building upon the knowledge of their predecessors where they can, and preserving it where they can't. And, unfortunately for us all, forgetting it when they shouldn't. Yes, that's how history ends up repeating itself. More Sam. And what's to come. The Maesters don't believe in prophecy with good reason. The children of the forest supposedly could see into the future, yet was surprised by the first men who nearly ended their race, and the long night, oh. which nearly ended us all. Children of the future could see, of the Some forest could see into the, the future? Some magical sight was invented long that. after they vanished from Westeros. Oh, I probably did. By singers hoping to thrill peasant girls. Not that most maesters have much experience in what does or doesn't do that. <laughs> when Aegon the Conqueror came to the Iron Islands, the priest King Lodos claimed his divine father, the Ironborn's drowned god, had shown him krakens pulling Aegon's ships into the deep. Yeah, they've mentioned krakens, krakens ever arrived, a couple times. Had, Did we ever see those? Because that'd be scary. Aegon and his dragons scary. wings of their own. Confused, Lodos filled his pockets with stones and walked into the sea to take counsel with his father. Thousands followed him, but apparently the drowned god didn't appreciate a crowd. Their corpses washed upon the Iron Islands for years. So they're saying that he drowned them because legend, of that, not because they just House drowned? House Targaryen survived the doom of Valyria thanks to Daenys the Dreamer, who foresaw the calamity and convinced her father to flee their homeland. It could be true. The Targaryens were always a bit... more. But as Maester Yendel points out, in the East, the Targaryens were one of a thousand minor noble families, and in Westeros they became kings. Politics not prophecy, could have drawn them to our shores. Mm. Politics can also explain the prophecies of Daemon Blackfire II, a Targaryen bastard rumored to possess the family gift. While posing as a hedge knight, he told a future Lord Commander of the Kingsguard that he dreamt of a dragon hatching at Whitewall's castle and took it as a sign that he'd win the Iron Throne. Perhaps if he'd slept a bit longer, he'd have dreamt of the King's hand putting down his rebellion a day later before it even began. Most like... maesters dismiss all Targaryen claims of prophecy as mystic nonsense. 
any sort of like blood, even if they are a bastard, I feel like would fair, have that magic in them. The it makes sense. Sea, there isn't a market without a wall up from Carth telling fortunes or a the whole shadow bastard thing from a shy reading fates in blood. Or so I hear from the maesters. <laughs> but when I was a boy, I overheard the cook whispering to a maid about a woods witch camping outside Horn Hill who was called Maggie the Frog. Is that the one that now Circe saw? That was probably that a corruption correct? of the Eastern word for wizards. Maggie. One day my father rode oh. out hunting, though no About game Cersei was in season. Kids? And whatever power she had, likely didn't save her. Even the wisest maesters, however, have no answer for the Red Priests who prophesy about the return of the Long Night. For thousands of years, they've kept watch for the return of the prince who was promised, who will be born amid salt and smoke to drive off the darkness once again. But the Lord Prince of the Light? Of what realm? Promised by whom and to Was that someone different? The prophecy doesn't say. But at the very least, it confirms that not even Essos escaped a long night. I imagine the Cataclysm must have confused the East. Unlike Westeros, they wouldn't have known of the Night King, or the White Walkers, or the war waged by the First Men and the Children mm. of the Forest. They would have just seen a terrible winter descend and linger far too long until spring magically returned to the world. Yet somehow, Maybe from passing merchants, maybe in their fires, the Red Priest saw the truth. Now the truth is here again, for anyone to see. But the yes. Maesters refuse. They debate and question and doubt, not to choose the wisest course, but because they're too used to doing nothing else. Just Most to prophecies sit and might be and talk lies, about it. but yeah. not all of them. The long night is coming. If we don't believe that, well, we won't need any prophecy to tell us our future. They all just be spooky-eyed monsters. Ooh, the dragon pit. In its time, the dragon pit was a marvel of the world. <laughs> Full-grown Targaryen dragons nested beneath its massive dome. And even on the darkest nights, the walls seemed to glow with the fire of the great beasts Okay, inside. so it did have a... a talked to it before. That's what I was wondering in the last episode. The Sept of Remembrance. When Magor the Cruel blasted it with dragon fire during morning prayers. The screams of the dying men echoed through King's Landing all yeah, that day. That sounds familiar. And a pall of ash and smoke hung over like the city Cersei for did. a week. But as it dissipated, so too did the rebellion of the Faith Militant. The Sept of Remembrance faded from memory. And Magor decided to replace a monument to the gods with a monument to his family, the Dragon Pit. Labor proved elusive, however, for after the Red Keep was finished, Magor had hosted a three day feast for all the builders, stonemasons, and carpenters who had worked to build it. At its conclusion, he slaughtered them. Wasting white. So that oh. only he would know the castle's secrets. Oh. So many men fled the construction of the Dragon Pit. But Magor was forced to employ the prisoners of the city dungeons, supplemented by skilled and ignorant builders from across the narrow sea. Mm, probably uh, made for some For more than a century, the Targaryens housed their dragons structure. in the dragon pit. But dragons are not horses to be stabled or hounds to be kenneled. With each generation, the dragons became less... Mm, smaller. Less massive, less swift, less long -lived. So sad, especially with the chains and less invulnerable. During the Dance of Dragons, two Targaryen factions killed a handful of their family's dragons while fighting each other. A frenzied mob even broke into the dragon pit and slaughtered the five dragons chained there. Though the last managed to bring down the roof of the Great Dome on its assailants. Oh, that's how the, the dragons fell. never recovered okay. their former strength. Or wow, numbers. look at the dragon faces. Perhaps their line had been too broken. I feel like that might have been or House of the Dragon spoilers, but I honestly didn't really catch what they had said, so it's all good. Further. But the last dragon Because I heard no Dance of the Dragons and went, <gasps> and, and then didn't really Aegon, was too his name panicked, the being dragon scared that it was spoilers that I didn't really pay attention. <laughs> dragons. The roof remained where it had fallen. The great bronze doors rusted and fell off oh, the hinges. Okay, yeah, so this is where they walked Prostitutes into it last time. Prostitutes where fantastic creatures had once fed and slept. Then came Daenerys. 
Now dragons once again darken the sky. They're but they'll never darken the dragon pit again. Yeah. Daenerys has learned the folly of chaining her dragons. The dragon pit is and will remain a ruin of the There's three in that age, image, though, but there, we know that there's only two. Flew high above their countrymen. Well, there is still three, but one of them's a monster. According to legend, a huntsman once tracked a lion that was terrorizing his village all the way to its den. Though armed with only a spear, the man managed to kill both the lion and its mate, but spared the cubs. This mercy so pleased the old gods that they sent a shaft of sunlight deep into the cave, gleaming off golden walls. Yeah, because the you don't kill little a miner and built a ring fort to animals. guard his new wealth. Nobody ever asks what happened to the cops. Maybe the gods forgot about them and they starved. Maybe no. there never were any cops, a lions, a hunter. Doesn't matter. Someone found enough gold in that cave to buy whatever truth he wanted, along with a castle that he'd name after his new family. Casterly Rock. Mm. Thanks to that gold, Casterly Rock soon became the largest, wealthiest, and best defended castle in Westeros. It was? An army that struggled up the main approach I would still have to climb yeah, thick, to high, and well defended to. walls. Should they choose instead to lay siege, the sea helpfully carved a massive cave beneath the castle, which over time became a private port complete mm. with docks, wharves, and shipyards. And so to this day, even with all the gold in Westeros to tempt invaders, Custody Rock has never fallen. At least, not in battle. The castle yeah. is sadly all that remains of its namesake family, the Castellys. According to another legend, my ancestor, Lan the Clever, swindled the castle from them. The most common story oh, so is didn't that he found from a hidden the cleft in the rock that makes and sense. snuck into the castle. At night, he whispered threats into sleeping ears, howled in the darkness, planted mm. one brother's treasures in the room of another, and so forth. By the end of his games, the Castellese believed a demon was haunting their home and fled. My brother prefers a different version. That's... Lan the Clever yeah. did find a secret entrance into the rock, but used it to have his way with the Castelli maidens. Eventually, the girls gave birth to golden-haired bastards, and the Castellese had no choice but to accept their father into the family. In gratitude, he changed the family name to honor himself, and House Lannister was born. I don't the Castellese used the gold of the rock to become like lords. Either, maybe it's a combination the Lannisters of the two. became kings. For thousands of years, the kingdom of the rock ruled the Westerlands. When the Ironborn became a nuisance, my ancestors sailed to the Iron Islands and returned with a hundred Ironborn hostages, promising to hang one from the rock every time the Ironborn dared raid our shores. The Yeesh. Ironborn stayed away. Well, after twenty or so. When the Andals oh, arrived after sweeping across the rest of Westeros, we invited their sons and daughters into the rock as squires and court ladies. I don't think we ever had to hang any of them. Finally, Aegon the Conqueror defeated us on the Field of Fire, and my ancestor knelt. Still, little changed but titles and taxes. For when Visenya Targaryen saw the rock, she gave thanks that my ancestor had met Aegon on the field. Even dragon flame would have washed over the castle like the waves and left just as much a mark. But now the mines are dry, and Casterly Rock is just that. A rock. And in death. Our gold has passed into legend just like the merciful huntsman and land the clever. As will our family if we lose this war. Unlike the Casterlys, however, we won't even have a castle to remember our name. So is it still taken over by oh, that song? Great Worm in them right now? When vassals, most lords send armies. My father Tywin only had to send a singer. There's no faster way to dull a vassal's ambition or any festive occasion than hearing the reigns of Castamere. The house reign of Castamere was an old and proud house that was slowly sinking back into the muck. Their minds had run dry. Without gold, they turned to a more common source of wealth. Daughters. Lady Ellen Rain was betrothed to my great uncle, but when he fell in battle, Lady Ellen sought comfort in his twin brother's bed, beating out the other woman he promised to marry. Then the husband, who had shared his twin's wife, shared his twin's death on a different battlefield. Lady Ellen she flung herself at the new and married around. heir to the rock. <laughs> but my grandfather Titus 
was more kitten than lion. He ran away and told his wife of Lady Ellen's designs, and Lady Ellen soon found herself married off to Walter and Tarbeck, lord of another failing house. The Reigns and Tarbecks should have sunk into obscurity together, and they would have if not for my grandfather becoming lord of Casterly Rock. At first, the Westerlands laughed with the Laughing Lion, as the jovial Titus was called. But when men realized this lion had neither teeth nor claws, they started to laugh at him. None laughed harder than the Reigns and Tarbex. So Though Rains Lady Ellen was no longer welcome at Castle family. Rock, Rains Titus cast. didn't refuse her brothers, Roger and Reynard Rain. Not even when they asked for extravagant loans. Thanks to our family's gold, Lady Ellen restored Tarbeck Hall to a splendor she hadn't known since being cast out of our home. When my grandfather broached the subject of repayment, Roger and Reynard only laughed. And soon enough, my grandfather was laughing along with them. Then my father Tywin returned from the War of the Nine Penny Kings, where he'd seen how the rest of the realm sniggered at House Lannister. Oh, I Determined bet he didn't like that. Our proper place. Yep. My father demanded the immediate repayment of all debts to the Rock, or a hostage from those who couldn't pay. Reynard Rain merely laughed when he received the Raven. Lord Walder and Tarbeck chose to ride to Casterly Rock, sure that he could cow Lord Titus into rescinding my father's commands. He could have. Except, it wasn't Titus who met him at the gates, but my father, who had Lord Walderman thrown into a dungeon. Lady Ellen protested. The rains threatened war. And finally, my grandfather broke and released Lord Tarbeck with an apology, no less. As if bathing himself in shame, Titus further forgave all the Tarbeck debts to our house. To celebrate the end of hostilities, Lord Roger feasted kind of Titus in this one. There's so many the two people lords in this world. proclaimed their friendship for eternity. My father allowed eternity to last a year. When he summoned the Reigns and Tarbeks to Casterly Rock to answer for their crimes, they, kind of looks like they rose Tywin. in revolt. If he, exactly, if he was as younger. he expected. Their defiance gave him a pretext to call his banners and ride for Tarbeck Hall and Castany with an army behind him. He didn't even bother to inform my grandfather. My father's army descended on the Tarbeck so quickly that Lord Walderon had no time to gather his forces and rode against my father with only his household knights. Soon, his head, his son's heads, and the heads of any man with Tarbeck blood adorned the spears of the Lannister vanguard Another as battle. it marched to Tarbeck Hall. How many people have died in this world in these Lady types Ellen of battles? Lady Ellen closed the gates and sent ravens to her brothers at Castamere. Is that supposed to be her she hair? It's like Rapunzel. To Is that what this is supposed to be? Break what would be a long siege. My father had trebuchets up in a day and brought down the keep within hours. Lady Ellen and her son were crushed in its fall. Oh, no. When the Tarbic forces surrendered, my father put their castle to the torch. Roger Rain arrived with his army just in time to see the flames consuming his sister's home. He charged my father's camp, hoping surprise would win out over my father's greater numbers. It didn't. With half his men dead on the field and a crossbolt in his Is back, it? Lord Roger fled back to Castamere. The Lannister host arrived at Castamere three days later. Like Castle Rock, the seat of House Rain had begun as a mine. When the gold gave out, the mine shafts were widened into halls, galleries, and bedchambers deep beneath the earth. Mm. The I'd Rain brothers didn't have the men to defend the castle walls and retreated into their underground stronghold. Yeah. From this relative safety, they offered terms to my father to avoid a long siege. My father didn't reply. Instead, he commanded that the mines be sealed with stone and soil until there was no way in and no way out. When that was completed, it took less than a day to dam the stream beside the castle and only two to divert it to the nearest mine entrance. Oh no! The rains had taken more than 300 men, women and children into the mines. A few guards reported hearing faint screams and shouts below them one night. Yeah, I was just saying how terrifying it would be. Was silent once again. Oh, and Tywin the is messed up. The halls, with no one left to hear. Is that why that's like the song that's like scary to them of like thing that's going to be half bad things are going to happen when that song what is the played? It makes dreams, sense. The hand of the king builds or so say the kings, the hands 
and the lords who wish to be hands. The lowborn put it differently. The king eats and the hand takes the shit. The fact is, most kings hate ruling. We shouldn't blame them. Their only qualification is blood. Yeah, so I naturally they have wear the actual smart seats made of blades. Far better to find other men and to rule in their stead. They are but how should a king select his hand? Family? One king chose his brother, Prince Magor, a warrior who was proud and arrogant. Magor agreed to marry the High Septon's niece to unite the faith and the crown, but then secretly wed a second wife in a Valerian ceremony, artfully combining bigamy and heresy. And when word of it got out, the king was forced to exile Magor and choose a Septon as his new hand. But the damage had been done. Angry face. The king had trusted in family, and his brother had set off a rebellion that would claim his rule and his life. Strength? As little more than a boy, Sir Criston Cole replaced the legendary Sir Ryan Redwine on the King's Guard and soon rose to Lord Commander. But knights only know one way to settle disputes. Fighting. When Prince Aegon's father died, Sir Criston slit the throat of an advisor who objected to Aegon's ascension over his aunt, the anointed heir. His actions so pleased the new king, Aegon, second of his name, that he appointed Sir Criston as his hand in the ensuing civil war, called the Dance of Dragons. Neither Sir Criston, nor the king, nor even the Targaryen dragons would survive it. Perhaps it's no surprise that the wisest king in the history of Westeros made the wisest choice for his hand. The son of a lowly blacksmith, Septon Barth had few options for advancement in the world, and even fewer after his family gave him to the faith as a child. But as royal record keeper, Barth impressed the king so much that the king Defying Which all his highborn advisors, king was he made into? Septon Bath his hand. Forty years of prosperity ensued. So much did Bath accomplish that many lords and commoners credited him with sorcery. No other <laughs> explanation could they accept for a man without blood or skill at arms. Because so good that it had to be Barth witchcraft. Had was rarer than both. A sharp mind. Years later. The realm had no sharper minds than Lord Tywin Lannister hand to King Aerys Targaryen, or, as history remembers him, the Mad King. He saw assassins and plots in every shadow, heard whispers in silence, and burned men alive. Yeah, but his greatest madness by far was driving away Lord Tywin. The Mad King then cycled through every mistake of his ancestors. Soldiers, toadying lords, and at the end, even an alchemist, perhaps to save the crown's growing expenses on wildfire. Unfortunately, it didn't save his crown or his dynasty. The new King Robert chose his foster father, Lord John Arryn, as his hand. The wisest foster? decision Robert ever made. Not that it had many rivals. Too bad it proved so fatal. Yeah, but you, Lord Arryn Baelish. was a man of honor from an ancient and proud family. Yeah. But honor is no shield against the corruption of the capital, as Lord Arryn's successor, Ned Stark, learned as well. Bye. Perhaps the hand of the king is a flawed idea. Westeros needs a ruler who can rule, who builds what he dreams himself. That I agree. A king who can't govern his kingdom is no king, and a hand who shits what another man eats is an ass. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. High Garden by Randall Tarly. The Tyrells claim High Garden, but they didn't build it. Yeah, so why is he talking from about the it? The first king of the Reach, but only through the female line. The truth is that House Gardener built High Garden when they ruled the Reach as kings, not lords. And as their name attests, they were the true heirs of Garth the Gardener, who founded their house and the kingdom and brought law and order to the Reach. He built High Garden as a fortress, not a playhouse. I would like house. to live in High Garden. That sounds like the nicest the place. And those dark raided up and down the Mando at will, and the Dornish were even more trouble than they are now. Yes. While enduring shame, a Dornish army once sacked High Garden and destroyed the Oaken Seat, the living throne of the Gardener Kings, planted by Garth Greenhand himself. Oh, it's mean. The Gardeners How pretty it was. wisely. Sending armies of their own to pacify and defend the countryside. 
My ancestors at Horn Hill joined them, as did the other great oh, yeah, families of the Reach. Al they Even were allies. House Hightower Tiger. yielded without a fight, choosing marriage into House Gardner over a war that would weaken us against outsiders. But the outsiders still came. The Andals swept across Westeros, destroying many ancient families and kingdoms. When the invaders arrived at the Reach, led by Sir Alistair Tyrell, House Gardner chose accommodation over battle, hoping honors and marriages would sate the foreigners' ambitions. The Tyrells were welcomed into service as hereditary stewards of High Garden. Thousands of years later, they repaid the gardeners for their acceptance. When Aegon Targaryen declared that Westeros was now his, King Myrn the Ninth allied with King Loren Lannister of the Westerlands. Together, they fought to save Westeros from another foreign barbarian, whose family practices put decent men to shame. But the dragons won. So that's extra bad then. The fire claimed Myrn and all his that sons Daenerys and grandsons killed and them the way that they did, huh? Instead of using so the probably castle for what it was built to do. Extra wide tier and was like, Tyrell nope, let's not do this. Surrendered it to Aegon without a fight. In exchange, Harlan was given the castle his family had served for thousands of years with all its attendant yeah, lands and lords. Pretty flowers. Including my family. Perhaps the Tyrells were great once, but Harlan gave away their honor when he opened gates that weren't his to open oh. and to a foreign invader. So there Ever was since some there tension hasn't there. Been a Lord Tyrell, who wasn't a mockery of the title. Yeah. Women rule that house. All right, that. Everybody knows it. Screw and look what it's that. Their proper lord, heir, and queen, dead leaving only a shrunken old woman who forgets her loyalties to the realm either in grief or dotage but her well, thorns won't protect her more than any other rose when the hand comes to rip them out well look what happened to you there sir but i get why it was probably a bad look for uh daenerys to use her dragons this to kill world him then. wasn't always so small and petty Thousands of years ago, while the rest of men prayed to gods, the Valyrians became them. Through magic or sheer will, they mastered the greatest creatures in history. A horse grants man dominion over the land, a ship over the sea. But dragons gave There's us the sky. There's a lot of dragon talk in and this, everything this one. And everyone beneath it. At its height, my ancestors ruled the known world. Whatever parts we didn't, weren't worth knowing. Our capital of Valyria shamed the magnificent cities of the east. For that hammers cool and chisels city. were no match for dragon fire and sorcery. It was a city and an empire built to last until the end of Good time. a little rooftop party. It didn't. 400 years ago, the doom fell on Valyria. Mountains cracked open like eggs, lakes and rivers boiled, fountains of fire, ash and smoke spewed from the ground, so high and so hot that even dragons burned in flight. The land oh. splintered and the angry oh. sea rushed in. In hours, the greatest city in history became history. But my ancestors the doom? didn't burn or happen? drown with the rest of their race. Twelve years before the doom, despite the sneers of his rivals, Einar Targaryen abandoned the capital with his family. Mm. Legends claim that his daughter foresaw the destruction of the city in a dream. More likely, Einar met with some mishap at court and chose exile over execution. He and House Targaryen slinked away to a dreary, remote, godforsaken island. Forsaken? No longer. Well, with arts why now they lost to the destroyed world, with everyone else? we transformed a tiny outpost into Dragonstone, a fortress fit for the last dragon lords. Then Einar's descendants settled into it like a tomb for their lost homeland. Until Aegon. When he looked east, he saw the past, old, tired, dead. But when he looked west, 
He saw the future. Gold in the ground, gold in the fields, and no dragons in the sky but his. He and his sisters, Rhaenys and Visenya, so flew over the great continent, <laughs> ostensibly visitors to a strange land. But when Aegon returned, he ordered construction of a massive table carved in the shape of Westeros, yeah. with all the notable rivers and mountains that they had seen. A personal map of the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah, that's a really cool then table. ruled by seven squabbling families. House Durandon held the Stormlands from their seat at Storm's End, due south of Dragonstone. House Hora of the Iron Islands had also conquered and enslaved the Riverlands and ruled them from Harrenhal, a monstrous castle rising on the shore of the God's Eye. House Stark held the frozen wasteland of the north, the oldest, largest, and emptiest of the kingdoms. House Lannister held the Westerlands, the wealthiest kingdom, thanks to their gold mines. House Gardner held the Reach, the second wealthiest kingdom, thanks to their crops. House Arryn held helpful. the Vale, <laughs> or rather the Vale held them. The mountains were impassable, except through the bloody gate, which had never been taken. House Martell held the deserts of Dawn, probably because no one else wanted them. Together, the Seven Kingdoms made Westeros, a realm that wasn't yet a realm, ruled by great families who didn't know what greatness was. Aegon would teach them. Interesting. I mean, I guess I technically knew that always, but it was Though really House helpful Darren to see that all laid out like that. Storm Kings, they were little more than gusts. Their kingdom in the Stormlands had been doddering to its end for the past few centuries, helped along by other houses, most of all by House Hora, who were nearly finished with a monstrous castle at Harrenhal. Too large Whoa. and too costly a seat to rule only the that Riverlands. That was a big room. King Argilac knew where the Ironborn would soon turn. You'd think a king who wanted to keep his crown would be wary of a man with fire-breathing monsters. But King Argilac Durandon wasn't called the Arrogant for nothing. Determined to arrest his family's decline, he sent an envoy to Dragonstone to enlist Aegon Targaryen and his dragons against his enemies. In exchange, Argilek offered lands he didn't have, and a wife Aegon didn't need. For, as the Valerians did, Aegon had wed his elder sister, Visenya. Then, as the Valerians didn't, he took the younger, Rhaenys, as well. Two sisters, two wives. Perhaps that's why he was so, so keen strange. to get off Dragonstone. Aegon countered Argilac with courtesy. He sent his own envoy requesting that Princess Durandon's hand be given instead to Aegon's closest friend and rumored half-brother, Aurus Baratheon. Argilac answered with a box and a note. These are the only hands your bastard shall have of me. Inside the box were the hands of Aegon's envoy. Oh How long had Aegon been waiting for such a pretext? As his army prepared to sail, ravens flew to every great lord of the Seven Kingdoms. All bore the same message. From this day forth, there would be but one king in Westeros. Those who bent the knee to Aegon of House Targaryen would keep their lands and titles. Those who took <laughs> up arms against him would be thrown down, humbled, and destroyed. Poor wow. old Argilac. He couldn't even match Aegon in arrogance. Aegon landed at the mouth of the Blackwater River and raised a primitive Aegon fort in the disputed land between Harren's and Argilac's kingdom, so that neither could decide whose problem he was. Adopting the customs of the Seven Kingdoms, Aegon unfurled his own banner with a red three-headed dragon breathing fire so upon the black So he just wanted field. it because he wanted Visenya it? Visenya crowned him with a ruby-studded circlet of valerian steel, while Rhaenys hailed him as the first High King the continent had seen since the Dawn Age. As his lords and the gathered locals cheered him, Aegon named his loyal friend to a small council led by Oris Baratheon whom he called my strong right hand. The title stuck, and a bastard became the first hand of the king. But for now, Jeez. Aegon's kingdom contained only a rocky island and a handful of fields. The other kings had larger armies, ships, castles, and thousands of years of rule. But Aegon had dragons. He had chosen for the words of his yeah. house, fire and blood. Before he was done, the rivers, fields, and skies would turn red. 
So. Oh. Aaron of House Hor inherited a kingdom that stretched from the Iron Islands to the Triton. Too great a kingdom to rule from a castle as shit as Pike. For 40 years, his ironborn plundered the Riverlands for stone, timber, and slaves to build a seat worthy of him. Legend has it that Masons laid the final stone in Aranor on the very day that Aegon landed in Westeros. Could have been a divine omen. Yeah, and then Could have been the Masons crushed it all? to fuck off before the dragons got there. They weren't the only ones. At Aegon's approach, Heron's river lords revolted, led by House Tully. I thought Heron noticed. Heron Hall could repel an army of a million men. No Not ladder could dragons. summon its walls, and no ram could shatter them. The castle was as impregnable as an old mate's cunt. Heron shut his gates around himself, his sons and his ironborn and waited for Aegon's army to drain back into the muck. They, when they Aegon finally the saw the monstrous castle, he asked for parley. Oh. Aaron granted it. Valyria had been the greatest empire the world had ever seen. Aaron wanted to piss on its ashes. Yield now, and you may remain as lord of the Iron Islands. Oh, he gave him a choice first. Yield now. And your sons will live to rule after you. You see my army outside your walls. You see my dragons. What is outside my walls is of no concern. Those walls are strong and thick. Dragons fly. <laughs> but stone doesn't burn. When the sun sets, it's magic fire, though. Your line shall end. Oh, that's a threat. Aaron spat and returned to his castle. Once inside, he promised lands, riches, and Tully's daughters to whoever could bring down Aegon or his dragon. As the sun sank below the horizon, all of Heron's men patrolled the battlements, hearing wings in every gust of wind. But the moon rose and sank, and no dragon appeared. While the Ironborn were ringing the battlements, Aegon drove his dragon Beleriand higher and higher in the night sky, so that even the great castle of Harrenhal looked like an anthill below them. Then they plunged straight into the castle. Am I like well scared? Like it's about to happen to me. <laughs> the five towers of and I know what happens reached too. towards Aegon like a hand. Beleriand opened his mouth and bathed all the fingers in flame. Harren was right. Stone doesn't burn, but men do. Yeah. Even when they're Ironborn. <laughs> the dragon blasted my ancestors into ash that choked the survivors when they screamed. Heron's soldiers leapt from the battlements and died. They huddled against the walls and died. They fled across the yard and died. Heron and his sons took shelter inside the castle. The stone didn't burn, but as Beleriand blasted it with fire, it glowed. White hut. <laughs> the world's greatest castle became the world's greatest oven, Ugh. baking the last of house yeah. horror within it. Outside the castle walls, the towers of Heron Hall glowed red against the night and began to twist and melt like yeah. five huge candles with liquid stone trickling Ugh. down their sides like wax. The next morning, Aegon forged a new Riverlands. He named the rebel Edmund Tully as his Lord Paramount of the Trident and had the other river lords swear him fealty as their new liege. For centuries, House Horror had terrorized the Riverlands. Under House Tully, the Riverlands would at last return to peace and prosperity. After the castle cooled enough to allow men inside, oh, Aegon ventured into the ruin he'd made of Heron Hall. He saw the ashen bodies, the scorched stone, and the mangled and melted swords of his former enemies. To his men's confusion, he ordered these useless swords collected and sent to his oh. eagle fort. That how the Iron Throne was made? While Aegon marched on Harrenhal after his coronation, 
Oris Baratheon had taken most of his forces and his queen, Rhaenys, with her dragon south to deal with the excuse for the invasion. Argilac the Arrogant, King of the Stormlands. Argilac had his seat at Storm's End, a castle considered the most impregnable in Westeros after Hall. Argilac may have been arrogant, but he wasn't stupid or a coward. His lords advised him to shut his gates and wait out the siege. But he'd heard what had happened at Hall and That's refused to die plan. a suckling pig cooked in his own castle. He would meet victory or defeat the same way, with sword in hand. He called his banners and marched to meet Oris Baratheon in the field. Thanks to Rainer's dragon, Miraxis, Oris knew Argilac was coming, how many men he had and how fast he marched. So Oris simply seized the high ground and dug in on the hills to wait for Argilac. As the two armies approached, the wind rose to meet them and the rain poured from the sky, a gale which would give the battle its name, the last storm. King Argilac's lords urged him to wait for the weather to die down. But a storm king saw that the rain was blowing into the faces of the Baratheon men on their hills. And Argilac outnumbered the Baratheon host two to one, with four times as many knights and heavy horse. Argilac attacked. I'm still amazed at how many people Three there are in this world. Argilac led his knights against the Baratheon line, but the hills and, like, were steep, in and the, the rain had beat the earth to mud. The war horses foundered and slipped, and the charges collapsed. The battle seemed lost, until Argilac ordered his spearmen up the hill. Blinded by the rain, the Baratheons didn't see them until it was too late. One hill fell, then another, and another until only one remained in the Baratheon center. If Argilac could break through there, he could split the invading army and flank both halves. Argilac and his men charged, and the Baratheon line broke, revealing Queen Rhaenys and Meraxes. Argilac's vanguard burst Meraxes. into flame and his men panicked. The victory charge fell into chaos. Yeah, and having Argilac dragons on your side horse, really... But he didn't yield. Is what when Oris helps Baratheon you win these arrived, things, huh? He found the old king holding off half a dozen men, another half dozen dead at his feet. Dang. Oris dismounted That's to meet the king on equal footing and offered Argilac one final chance to yield. Argilac cursed him instead. As the storm raged around them, the grizzled old warrior and the bearded upstart fought for life and kingdom. In the end, Argilac got his wish. He died, sword in hand. He fought for it. As word of Argilac's death spread, his lords and knights threw down their swords and fled. <laughs> Oris and his vanguard rode to Storm's End to claim Argilac's castle for Aegon, only to find the gates barred and the walls manned. Argilac's daughter had assumed his crown, and the new Storm Queen was as fond of yielding as her father. But she she's gonna get Oris would win lit up by bones, the dragons? Blood and ashes here. Mm. But her men were weaker than her. And that night, Oris found Argilac's daughter delivered, gagged, chained, and naked to his camp. Oh, jeez. Argilac had refused to give Oris her hand. Now Oris could have any part of her he wished. But Oris unchained the girl, wrapped his cloak around her, and poured her a glass of wine. He told her he would take the arms, banner, and words of House Darrington to honor her father's courage in the last storm. Conveniently, Oris had none of his own to discard first. The crowned stag became the sigil of House Baratheon, and storms end their seat. Argilac's daughter would even remain in her home, though as a lady instead of a princess. Mm. The Stormlands were now Aegon's. Don't like that her people immediately and gave her up tribute, like that. Aegon demanded the swords of the men Oris had defeated. So yeah, that's how he For collected all purpose? the swords? Oris didn't know. For the throne. So it's of all like the people that he's defeated in that he defeated in the quest for the Iron Throne. So many Aegon there. now ruled two of the seven kingdoms. But he would no so he longer went kingdom be able to by kingdom piecemeal. For the first time in thousands of years, the kings put aside their squabbles and joined forces against a common enemy. My ancestor, King Loren of House Lannister, was head of the wealthiest family in the Seven Kingdoms. When King Loren joined his forces to Mern of House Gardener, King of the Reach, they had the mightiest army in history. 
a so-called iron fist to break the would-be conqueror. But while an iron fist can smash a man's face in battle, yeah, what is an iron silly fist? hunting birds or beasts with it. And Aegon had a creature that was both. The kings had never even seen a dragon, let alone fought one. They had fought each other for thousands of years, and victory always went to the larger army. Surely, a force five times that of Aegon's could manage one dragon. I don't know. But Aegon arrived with three. Still, the Lannisters and gardeners hoped for victory. The battlefield they chose was a wide plain with firm ground and clear skies, perfect for archers and mounted cavalry. But neither of the kings spared a thought for why the ground was firm. There had been no rain for a fortnight, which meant all the wheat and grass on it were bone dry. Perfect for dragons. At first, the kings looked like they would emerge victorious. When the horn blew for battle, their armies swept around Aegon's flanks, and there are iron fists of mounted knights smashed through his center before the dragons could even enter the fray. But then, Aegon and his sisters took flight and unleashed their dragons, not on the soldiers, but on the dry fields all around them. The iron fist unclenched and became a hand outstretched for mercy. Yeah, as Aegon horses. promised, he had none. More yeah. than 4,000 men died in the fires, another thousand escaping them. Tens of thousands returned home as monsters, burned and scarred beyond recognition. Yeesh. House Gardner never returned at all. The field of fire, as the singers call it, claimed the last of the Gardner line. I was going to say, I hadn't heard of the Gardners the before this. The wardens of the south. As for my illustrious ancestor, when King Lawrence saw the battle was lost, he rode through a wall of flame and smoke to safety or at least to a heroic capture a day later, where he laid his sword before Aegon and knelt. Wow. Aegon, true to his word, spared him and confirmed House Lannister as lords of Casterly Rock and Wardens of the West. Why would The dragons are really the Lannister things that... always pays his debts. The... And now we owed our lives to the crown. Yeah, got him a... That was worth got centuries this... of subservience, at least. The throne. Besides, Aegon had a fetish for collecting swords, not heads. He added Lawrence to the pile his men had retrieved from the field of fire and sent them back to the Aegon Ford. Yeah, I'm talking about the Starks. That's crazy to see how with it all went down. With most of the South in Aegon's hands, the best chance to throw back the Conqueror now lay with the North, if we cared enough to try. <laughs> Unlike our southern rivals, the Stark Kings of Winter didn't forge the North into one kingdom for glory or gold. There is little of either here, but to survive. Oh, the wolves. Alone in Westeros, the North remembered when worse than dragons lay waste to armies. Thousands of years ago, the sun set on the realms of men and the long night began. A new race emerged from the ice and snow, the White Walkers. Yeah. They demanded no crown, offered no terms, spared no life, and the dead marched with them. With humanity facing extinction, a Stark sought out the children of the forest, the most ancient beings in Westeros, and convinced them to ally with the men they'd once fought. Together, the two races pushed the Walkers oh, back into the land of always winter and that. sealed it off from the Seven Kingdoms with the Wall. 300 miles of ice, stone, and earth rising nearly yeah, 700 feet I feel like the South really tall. doesn't understand any to of God, this that the North actually the cares Watch, about. A brotherhood sworn to defend the living from the dead, whose vows erase both titles and crimes. After the long night, the Look North the tried puppies. to forget it belonged to a continent. Perhaps That's through pride, fair. perhaps through sheer ignorance. You never can tell with the North. But as news of Aegon's dragons spread, Torrenstar, the King of Winter, knew he couldn't forget Westeros any longer and summoned his lords to Winterfell. Many fools shrugged off the threat, while the rest placed wages on how long the South would take to burn. Torrens silenced them with a command to assemble their armies and descend from the North in force. As the kings of the Rock and the Reach burned on the Field of Fire, the greatest northern force since the Long Night crossed the Neck into the Riverlands. But when King Torrin arrived at the Trident, he saw, on the opposing riverbank, the combined strength of all Aegon's conquered kingdoms. A force larger than Torrin's own by half. Yeah. And with three dragons. 
That they night, didn't even try. King Torin called a conference of all his lords and advisors. Some wanted to fight and trust northern valor to carry the day. And You're burn so outnumbered. And the wisest of That's them crazy. wanted to withdraw to Moat Kaelin, the fortress which had thrown back every southern invasion, and burn there. One suicidal lord even wanted to ambush Aegon's camp in the dark and kill the dragons as they slept, or at the it's very the least, their fault. riders. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to tell what would have been his fate. Burning, beheading, dismemberment, perhaps all three. My ancestor listened to their counsel and in the morning crossed the trident under a flag of parley. Then King Torin of House Stark laid his ancient crown at Aegon's feet yeah. and was named Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. And the king who knelt. He had no choice, and thanks to him, our soldiers returned to their homes whole and unharmed. Yeah, look what happened to everyone else. The swords that Aegon took from them were not twisted, burnt, or mangled. Yet. Yeah, but they're seen as, like, not as strong because of that, I would imagine. Or, like, yeah, because they didn't fight back. The Vale of Arryn was the last of the great kingdoms left. Old and proud, House Arryn did what they always did in times of strife. They shut the bloody gate, sealing off the veil. Then the Queen Regent Shara of House Arryn retreated with her son, the boy King Ronal, into the Eyrie, their family's impregnable fortress. From the top of their mountain, they could look down on Westeros far below, it's, very its problems to hidden beneath Robin. the clouds. But one day, Queen Shara entered the outer courtyard to find her young son sitting on the knee of Visenya Targaryen and oh, ogling oh. her dragon Vega beside her. Yep, because they can fly Just right up there. Just as he asked for another cake at dinner, little King Ronald asked his mother if he could go flying on the nice lady's dragon. Visenya smiled at Shara. So, Shara imagined, did Vega. Remembering her manners, Shara asked if she could have Visenya brought some wine or food. <laughs> She must be tired after such a long flight. But Visenya demurred. Bored with his mother's pleasantries, Ronald demanded an answer. Poor boy. He didn't even understand the question. Yeah. Shara hesitated for a moment, then asked Visenya, as a mother, if it was safe for the boy. Visenya assured her. She was going to actually was. let him go? What choice did Shara have? Whilst her son circled the castle, she collected his little ringlet, her own regent's coronet, and the ancient falcon crown of mountain and vale which the Arons had worn for thousands of years. Ronald had taken to the sky as a king, but he landed as a lordling. Perhaps he considered his ancient rights a fair trade for a few minutes of flight as a little boy would. More likely, he didn't even notice the three crowns at Visenya's feet. Or oh. recognize the swords of his garrison beside them. So she, yeah, his mom then was like, okay, bring him back and we'll bend the knee type of thing. Yeesh. The heads of Westeros had bowed to Aegon, but its heart still beat free. Old Town, the center of the faith of the seven. There dwelt the High Septon, the father of the faithful, who commanded the obedience of all Westeros save the savages of the north and their old gods. Yeah, so they were kind of When Aegon things had landed before. in Westeros, the High Septon had locked himself in the Starry Sept and fasted for seven days and seven nights, one for each of his gods. All he received for his trouble was the divine wisdom that if Old Town took up arms against the dragon, the city would burn, faithful and faithless alike. Yeah. After the submission of House Stark, Aegon marched towards Old Town, steeling himself for another battle. But he found the gates open, with the High Septon welcoming him. Changed their the tune. pious fool even had the arrogance to grant what Aegon had already won, and anointed the last Valyrian as Aegon of House Targaryen, first of his name, King of the Andals and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm. As if titles meant anything to a man so, before whom time itself now bowed. The so Maesters would the hence divide all history the, into before title. and after conquest. Yeah. Most expected Aegon to stay and make Old Town his seat. 
but soon after his coronation, Aegon returned to the mouth of the Blackwater River, where he had first set foot on Westeros. A small town had since sprouted around his primitive fort. To honor their new master, the locals dubbed it King's Landing, though it looked more fit for a hedge oh. knight, with wooden palisades, muddy streets, and piles of mangled swords carted in from every corner of the conquest. But when Aegon made it his court, King, wood that's why it's called stone. King's Landing. Black okay. mud was buried beneath a red keep, and the collected swords of Aegon's foes were blasted by dragon fire and became a seat fit for the conqueror and the greatest dynasty this world has ever known. House Targaryen, my family, my throne. Or so it should have been. Oh yeah, you died. But it's like a throne that's won by con but conquering while Aegon ever really titled himself Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Is it owed to Daenerys reality, or even John? Only six. The know. seventh, Dawn, had never knelt. Yeah, that's Visenya true. Visenya had flown into the Vale and returned with its crown. Mimicking her sister, Rhaenys had flown over the enemy force holding the passes into Dawn and landed in the castle of its ruling lady, Princess Maria of House Martell. Maria was 80 years old, fat, bald, and blind. Behind her back, many sniggered at her as the yellow toad of Dawn. The beautiful Rhaenys probably thought as much when they met. She demanded Princess Maria kneel to her brother Aegon, though she allowed that on account of Maria's age and health, a simple vow of submission would do. But the princess told the queen <laughs> that the Look Targaryens weren't wanted in Dawn, and no Martell would ever bow, bend, or break, no matter how badly they burned. Rhaenys could have mounted her dragon right then and roasted Maria in the castle as her brother had done at Harrenhal. Yeah, why but didn't she? But whatever she saw in Maria's eyes, scared her right back to King's Landing, with a dragon's tail between its legs. After Aegon's coronation, Rhaenys returned to Dawn with Aegon and Visenya. Yeah, what and did she dragons. see? But no armies met them in the field, and no lords defied them in their castles. As the dragons approached, Dawn simply emptied. House Martell had learned from Harrenhal and the Field of Fire. The dragons were unbeatable in battle, but wars were more than battles. Where'd they Unopposed, go? Unopposed, Aegon claimed Dawn for his own. But as soon as he returned to King's Landing, his castellans were hurled off towers, and his royal garrison vanished in the desert, never to be seen again. Except, perhaps, when the winds change and the sands cough up old bones and armor. Rhaenys returned on Meraxes, intent on revenging herself against Maria Martell. But Dawn was no longer empty. The Dornish kept Maria's promise and fought even while burning under dragon flame. That kind of makes me respect the people won. of Dorn. One day a bow pierced the eye of Meraxes oh, no. and knocked the dragon out of the sky. House Martell remained unbroken, unlike the unfortunate Rainers. In their wrath, Aegon and Visenya set flame to every castle and city but Sunspear, trying to turn the people against House Martell. But the Dornish stayed loyal. And when Aegon returned to King's Landing, he found assassins waiting for him in the streets of his own capital. If not for Visenya, the Conqueror would not have enjoyed his conquest for very long. Visenya From then saved on, him? the king and his family would be guarded by the seven greatest knights in the realm, the King's Guard. When Maria died in her sleep, her weak and tired son sued for peace. But old Maria had mm. exhausted Aegon as well. And he granted the request. The Targaryens still wanted Dawn, and eventually so they, they would have it, oh, but not okay. at the point of a sword. They would buy it the same way great lords buy anything. With I a mean... daughter. What? That's kind of cool, though, that they were able to After be the, the only ones to hold them off. Up, they saw dragons. Nobles learned to keep their eyes down. But the gods weren't used to sharing the heavens. When Aegon died, the High Septon led the Faith and its army in revolt, claiming that the Valyrian tradition of wedding brother to sister was an abomination in the eyes of the Seven. Yeah. Though no one could explain where the divine mother and father had come from. My ancestor, Maegor the Wise, 
or make all the cruel as men slander him, put a bounty on the head of every militant priest, and miraculously, the faith soon returned to the sects. Hmm. With dawn in the fold and the faith put in its place, None in Westeros were left to oppose oh, my family. Cracked skull. So we started opposing each other. <laughs> in the Dance of Dragons, a Targaryen princess tried well, to steal her brother's throne. I don't want to hear about this throne. if it's like... Thanks spoilies. to her stupidity, most of our dragons died. The one, thankfully... Who couldn't rule his own mind, couldn't rule seven kingdoms. As the soldiers closed in, all the town bells It sounds like it's out. kind of just about the last dragons, and even if it's not spoilers for... House of the Dragon, I don't. Just in case, since I'm going to be starting it so soon, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, so with the, like they said, with the, the Targaryen, am I saying that right? Now it sounds like Targaryens? With the Targaryens just marrying each other and starting from, like, that ascent, they're all, like, kind of related, so I guess it's not that big of a deal that Jon and Daenerys are doing it, but still, it's, no, it is a big deal, but, like, you know, in the grand scheme of things for how the Targaryens have been doing things, it's not that big a deal. But interesting, I really, that was really helpful to see, why did it take so long to, for us to get the whole backstory of how Aegon conquered everything? Like, that was super helpful to see how he went about that, because I was, I had always been curious to see how it all went down. I know they had, like, hinted at or, like, shared bits and pieces along the way, but... Yeah, it was super interesting to see. But like I said, he just decided that he wanted to, that he should have control over everything, even though it was, I know that they, they said it was starting to become a little unsettled with everyone, with having different rulers of each of the seven kingdoms. But that's crazy that he was just like, well, this is going to be mine and I'm going to conquer it. And then he did because of the dragons, because the dragons are just, they really just make it so you have all the power when you have those dragons. That's crazy. But yeah, sets up a lot of good backstory, I feel like, for going into the last season, just kind of knowing how everything got started and and what they're fighting for with the Iron Throne, with like Daenerys being all like, I, this is my birthright, and now it's actually John's. But like the birthright started from such an interesting place of just like this one guy wanting to conquer it. It's like, who really has a right to anything? But I guess it's how all these things start at the end of the day, like any sort of king, queen, royal line. Broader conversation to have, but I feel like I didn't talk too much throughout this one because there was a lot to like digest and like listen and pay attention to, but it was helpful nonetheless. Lots of stuff about the dragons in this one is too, which makes me really excited for House of the Dragon and get more about the Targaryen backstory. I know I say this every time in the Histories and Lore video, but it is wild that this all came from the mind of one guy because every time in these especially in the histories and lore videos there's so much backstory and a new house a new family and like little like side stories about those families and it's just it's so much it's so crazy anyway i'm so excited to start season eight and see how this all wraps up if someone ends up on the iron throne if there is even an iron throne in the end like if there's someone ruling everything in the end of it all if we go back to not having a ruler or if the if the army of the dead ends up uh, being the ones who win, that could be a, a way to end it as well. But I'll share some more of my, probably just those similar predictions or more of my predictions in the next, or when I start season eight in the next video. So I think that's all for today though. And yeah, good background information. These always have, are good for like filling in more of that story. And like I said, I really like learning about all of like the step-by-step -step of how Aegon was able to conquer each of, this, each of the different kingdoms. So that was really helpful. But anyway, as always, thanks for watching with me. Bye.